Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As you know, the X-15 is one of my most favourite aircraft, able to hit altitudes and speeds that nothing else could match in the 1960s. And, uh, you know, as it turns out, the North American X-15 was almost a different aircraft. Now, let's rewind a little. Back in the 1960s or 1950s when they started looking at this, the Air Force wasn't the only people doing research on high-speed rocket-powered aircraft. If you go back to the X-1, the Air Force built that and they wanted to exceed the speed of sound. But around the same time, the Navy was also flying an aircraft called the D-5581. Sky Streak, and that was powered by a conventional jet engine, and that actually contributed greatly to the understanding of transonics. That means where you're getting very close to the speed of sound and the airflow over some parts of the aircraft is exceeding the speed of sound. Now, they never got faster than that uh, unless they got into a dive, but they certainly contributed to the understanding. And the Air Force, sorry, the Navy continued this kind of high speed research program on their own and they developed the next one. That would be the, um, the D558 II Skyrocket. And that was a rocket powered version. It was much faster. In fact, it was the first aircraft to exceed Mach 2. And then, of course, they were looking to do the next version up, going higher and faster still. And I don't know, somebody got the idea to go for a nice round number for altitude. They wanted to go to 1 million feet. And the Douglas Aircraft Company took this and they began designing. And they found out that, in fact, it could be theoretically possible to get up to about 1 million feet. In fact, they thought they could go even higher. That's about 300 kilometers for all you people asking about a speak only metric. The problem with going so high is that you pick up a lot of speed on the way back down and pulling out of such a steep dive would be very hard in the aircraft and most likely lethal to the pilot. So their proposal suggested that they tone down the altitude requirements by a factor of about 30%. And their rough design looks a lot like what we would consider the X-15. It would be known as the Douglas D671, and it would use a fancy titanium structure with an ablative cooling, cooling surface to protect it from the extreme heats during re-entry. Now, around the same time, the US Air Force and the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, NACA, the precursor to NASA, they were also looking at hypersonic aircraft. And oddly enough, the Air Force was far more conservative with its design. NACA was a little further out, but the Navy's design was just way out there in terms of capabilities. Around December of that year, they all got together and said, you know, we should just work on one aircraft and that would be the X-15. The performance goals for the X-15 was an altitude of 250,000 feet, that's about 75 kilometers, and speed of about 6,600 feet per second, which is Mach 6.7. Uh, and yes, that would ultimately turn into the X-15, and they had uh, four different design groups, uh, companies come along. There was Bell that had designed the X-1, there was Douglas that had designed the uh, B-558, uh, D-558, sorry, and there was North American and Republic. Both of those guys had worked on missiles and other stuff, but they hadn't really worked on X-planes. So at this, what happened was Douglas took their design for the 671 and they toned it down a little to create the Model 684. And the drawings for this look really very, very similar to what would become the X-15. It was powered by a Reaction Motors XLR30, which ran on a liquid oxygen and ammonia, so that made it pretty much the same fuel cycle as the Ultimate uh, X-15. But the one thing that really set the design apart from the three other competitors was the structure. While everyone else had used Inconel, they had used something called HK31. Now, HK31 is a thorium-zirconium alloy of magnesium. There's about 3% thorium, 1% uh, zirconium. And yes, that meant that the structure was slightly radioactive. Not enough to be a danger to the pilot, but definitely eyebrow-raising regardless.
HK31 would actually uh, get softer, start to creep at lower temperatures than Inconel. It would uh, get up to about 350 degrees, whereas uh, Inconel could go up to 650 degrees centigrade. But HK31 was a lot lighter and it had a much higher heat capacity. So that meant that they could use a thicker exterior and get more structural strength from it. And Douglas correctly realized that for this test program, the period of extreme heating would be very short. So since they could put on more material and since the higher heat capacity meant that it would absorb more heat, their structure would only reach about 300 degrees Celsius. And because it only reached a few hundred degrees centigrade, that meant that you didn't need a whole lot of internal insulation so they could eliminate that, making the whole thing lighter. The structure would ultimately be simpler because the panels would be a lot thicker. The tooling would be easier because magnesium was a lot easier to work with. Because they could eliminate internal structure, that meant they could put sensors in places that the other designs wouldn't be able to handle. And yeah, because the temperatures off it would be lower, the aircraft wouldn't glow red hot. And they suggest that this would be a psychological advantage to the pilot. And if they needed to give the pilot extra peace of mind, their design also included an escape system. The entire front of the aircraft would pop off and be pushed away from a failing aircraft using a JATO system. Then the whole thing would pop out a metal drogues chute to decelerate it down. And once that slowed itself, it would actually pop out a regular parachute and the whole capsule would land safely on the ground. Of course, this amazing extreme design would ultimately lose out to North American's design. And that's kind of amazing because North American had never actually built any X-planes, but it had built a lot of missiles and that was pretty much what the X-15 would be. But there was another thing that they did right. So, so North American, yeah, they stuck with the Inconel design. They talked to the engineers and the scientists that were running the project and looked at their goals. And really what they were interested in was to see how a hot aircraft would you know, work. So they didn't want it to be kept cold. They wanted it to get hot so they could understand it. Because after all, the next step past the X-15 might have been something that flew at these speeds and the, generated these temperatures for much longer. So they couldn't rely on this short-lived heat pulse to be the, you know, the limiting factor to be the, the trick that uh, Douglas was using to get around this. Indeed, in the mid 50s, somebody came up with a bright idea of creating an X-15B, which would be lofted on a Navajo rocket or a series of Navajo rockets, apparently, to take it into space and into orbit. And this, it would have needed to sustain a lot of heating for a long time during re-entry. And yes, that whole HK-31 alloy, that would probably disintegrate long before this reached the ground. So yeah, that's an interesting little cul-de-sac in aircraft development, a radioactive aircraft. Now the radioactive HK-31 was did actually find use in a lot of other applications. And uh, in particular, it was used in engines and certain a maintenance staff for certain engines would have to hack carry radiation monitors to make sure that they weren't exceeding their limits. Since then, of course, better alloys that have been are non-radioactive have been discovered and it's kind of disappeared. But, uh, you know, interesting little option there. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.